Hi, and welcome to Answers News for March 2nd, uh, 2017. And joining me with me today will be Dr. Tommy Mitchell. And we're going to have a good time today. Yeah, we are. We are. Um, so the reason that Ken cannot be here today is he is still at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And he's been receiving several um, awards for Answers in Genesis while he's down there. And so that's where he's at. And um, Bodie is, he's on the mend. Um, he is home from the hospital. He had his surgery, which was successful. He's had some complications. Um, but... He's dealing with those, and um, things are a lot better. He was joking with me the other day <laughs> through texting, so I knew he was feeling better. Um, so that was a good sign. Um, but anyways, he he is on the mend. But keep praying for him right. because um, he had some scary times there, and I'm sure he'll regale us with those uh, oh, stories. He, we'll get a blow by blow when he gets when back he to the returns, office. When he returns, right. so so um, so one of the things too I wanted to bring out was another name for Dr. Tommy Mitchell is Dr. Tommy Mitchell. Oh. Because Tommy here loves cats. I love cats. So, yeah. How I many have, cats do you have? Uh, too many. Too many. Four. I think he has four. I've got four. Yeah, four That's cats. So four which ranks many. higher, the cats or your Martin guitars? The vacuum cleaner ranks <laughs> higher than the cats. My we, wife is about the only thing above those guitars. <laughs> we we kid him a lot about his cats, as you can see. It's an ongoing joke You're here. Me. You're killing me. I know I'm killing you. you. I didn't even tell you. I just put down on here Tommy and cats that I needed to talk about that because I knew our audience would find it fascinating. So now I'm going to owe him big time. For yes, that. you are. So yes, I am. But anyway, so <laughs> they're not even his. They're not really his. No, cats. they're, they're my daughter's they're, cats. Yeah, they're the not. The reason yet. I have cats is I love my daughter very yes, much. Yes, I know you do. And she so, loves cats. You're a good dad. I try so. to be. Okay. All right. <laughs> On to the news for the day. Okay. This first one comes from the Daily Mail. And it says, female Dutch doctor drugged a patient's coffee, then asked her family to hold her down as she fought not to be killed, but did not break the country's euthanasia laws. This is one of those articles that you read it, and it's just, it's just chilling. Right. It, it's really chilling. Um, so this comes out of the Netherlands, which has a euthanasia law right. on the and, book. And has for many years. Right, like 17 years, I right. think, or something. So physicians are allowed to mm -hmm. kill their patients. I don't like saying physician-assisted suicide. It's murder. It's murder. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's just like a, it's a nice way of saying murder, basically. Well, physician-assisted suicide gives it sort of a clinical air, but uh, any physician I've ever practiced with, as far as I know, I've, I've never taken a poll of every single one, mm -hmm. I can't imagine any of those people thinking of this activity or this action as anything but murdering their patient. Yeah. So basically what happened in this was that this woman, she was over 80 or in her mm -hmm. 80s, and okay. she's suffering from dementia. And apparently at some point earlier on, she had said that she would want to, um, when the time was right, that she would want to be euthanized, okay? Mm -hmm. But that she didn't say when that was or whatever. So the doctor basically decided that because she was suffering from this dementia and really wasn't able to make that decision now, that she would make that decision for her. For her. Right. And so, um, so what she did was she drugged her coffee, which sedated her, and then tried to give her the lethal injection. And the family, and so she woke up during all of this and is screaming, I don't want to die. And they continue to hold her down, and the doctor kills her with a lethal injection. Now, as a do I mean, you're a medical doctor, right. so when you read something like this, what do you, I mean, how do you react to this? Well, I mean, I'm almost speechless just reading the reports because I can't imagine doing that. Because uh, I did a lot of intensive care medicine when I was in practice, but I also had an outpatient practice. Mm -hmm. I had a number of patients who were in the nursing home for various reasons, you know, age, debility. And I had a number of patients who were suffering from various degrees of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had those patients a lot of times in a ward where they couldn't get out. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. want to say lockdown because that wasn't the purpose. It was to keep keep them, them safe. Hurt, sure. Keep them safe. Yeah. And they had the run of the war. They could get out and move around and interact with one another. And certainly they didn't have the recall and they mm -hmm. were more confused. And sometimes they got agitated. But just walking through those wards, as I did for years, it never struck me that these people were somehow in distress or they were in an existence that wasn't worth living. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, they seemed comfortable. They had their routines, and it was unfortunate the, the right. circumstances they're in. Sure. But it wasn't my decision to say, "Okay, I deem your life now not worth living, so I'm going to terminate that life." Uh, it, it and, it's hard. And that's what you read all throughout this article is well, it was of the doctor's opinion right. that this was the time that the time was now right for this woman to be euthanized. And mm -hmm. it's all relative. I mean, who decides? Well, there's another aspect to these kind of decisions, and it's something, really, unless you're in clinical practice, you don't hear about these things. I had a number of patients who had chronic illnesses or uh, were debilitated in one fashion or another, and we would obviously talk about what their end-of-life decisions sure. were going to be, because I think patients have a right to make those decisions. If you've got a, obviously, terminal disease, you don't want all this technology inflicted right. upon mm -hmm. you. But I had any number of patients over the years that said, well, you know, Dr. Mitchell, uh, I've got, say, bad emphysema or whatever it may be. You know, don't ever put me on a, on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand that because it's not a comfortable situation right. to be in. But when the time came and they got really sick, they, they said, do whatever you yeah. have to do to make me comfortable. Right. And I totally respect that. So right. in this situation, this woman may have said at some point, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to live like. But at it's the time, yeah. it's not the doctor's decision. Right. And that's what's, and what's really scary is they're even, they've even taken this, they want to take it to court, not to charge the doctor with right. murder, no, but to rather clarify th that what she did was okay so that other doctors we'll don't have face guideline. the same we'll persecution. I mean, you just read it and, and you're like, wow, so now it's not the person making the decision. It's not physician-assisted suicide. It's just physician decided mm -hmm. to kill their patient. You know, it's not suicide at all. It's well, murder. I remember years ago when these things were first being discussed, because obviously in our even here in America, we're hearing more and more about mm -hmm. euthanasia and physician sure. assisted suicide things like that when they were first doing it in the netherlands there was this whole concept of the slippery slope right well, we're gonna it's gonna be just this very narrow group uh -huh. and then all of a sudden now it's been it expanded. expanded and the slippery slope is a very real concept mm -hmm. you know very real ideas mm -hmm. we're seeing here you know uh, children who are depressed and they're talking right. about all these different uh, groups of people who now may be uh, may benefit well, by, even children. That's from, you know, even children yeah, who are yeah. depressed, the, their doctors will decide their life's not worth living. Right. Well, and so th th this very narrow group of, uh, of categories and situations now greatly expanded. Well, people talk about, well, the slippery slope doesn't exist. Yes, it, it does. does. But what happens next? Now we have doctors saying, I don't think your life right. is worth living. They decide. What if that doctor or somebody else said, I don't think you should be allowed to think what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Because there are some people in the secular world today that have even suggested that certain types of thoughts yeah. would make you basically worthy of being terminated. That's just, yeah. Well, that's what happens right. when it's not based on God's word and it's just based on man's ideas. Right. It's just all and, relative. And I'm not suggesting what, that sort of right, horrific thing. Right, but it's is what here. it can lead but to. we started here, now we're here. Who's right. to say we won't be over right. here? Yeah, yeah. All right, this next article, okay, it was published um, on the Huffington Post website, but it actually comes from the Religious Dispatches, and it says the religious origins of fake news and alternative facts. So fake news is, you know, in the Internet age that we live in, right, um, there is a lot of that, and it's, it's websites that publish hoaxes a lot of times or misinformation on the Internet, because believe it or not, not everything on the Internet is true. Um, Excuse me, right <laughs> Right so down. people are very gullible, right? And they lack discernment, unfortunately, and they get sucked into those kinds of things. So, but what's interesting about this article is basically what the author is trying to claim that the reason that people are so amendable to fake news, well, is that conservatives actually are more amendable to fake news. They're the ones that are more likely to believe it. Right. And, um, and he says that basically... Uh, being a Christian, being conservative, makes you more likely to believe fake news. And why is that? Because of the belief in creation, right. and because um, of the belief that the Bible is the authority. Is the authority? Right. It is God's word. It is true in what it says. Right. So somehow, Christian fundamentalism, as he puts it, is responsible <laughs> for people <laughs> believing in fake news. Hmm. And and it's just you know amazing as I read through this. Um, they're saying they're they're saying well Christians you know they they question you know what the scientific elite and what the scientific experts say how dare they right yeah and you're sitting there thinking wait a minute but you're not questioning in the, them at all exactly right you're just accepting them so 
I mean, but that's that's wrong too. I mean, you're buying, you're actually buying, they're buying into fake news, mm-hmm. even though they wouldn't call it fake, even though they don't realize it's it's really the the lie and the problem. Well, I love this phrase in the article. It said Christian fundamentalism's rejection of what's described as expert elites. Well, first of all, who declared them experts? And they certainly feel themselves to be elite because mm-hmm. they're the keeper of knowledge and truth. Right. But as you say, uh, this article basically sets forth the idea that Christians reject you know, the truth because we reject evolution and we reject mm-hmm. this modern sort of critical analysis, of uh, higher criticism yeah. of the Bible because the scholars have shown the Bible's not true. The scholars have shown, shown that the Gospels weren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and right. it, 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 just all these things. And now they claim this to be absolute fact. And we're susceptible to fake news because we don't accept this new learning, if you will. Yeah, and it even said at one point, it said they, meaning Christians, right. have rejected the secular university as a site of neutral science and objective scholarship. And, you know, I read yep, that sentence that's... and I'm like, there's no such thing right. as neutral science or objective scholarship. It, and it really, I think one of the things that, as I read through this article, you can really tell this is, it's it's a worldview issue. Mm-hmm. It really is, because the you know the author is basically saying, well, because you reject man's ideas because you reject science quote unquote that therefore you're you know you're wrong i mean it's not that you i mean you're believing something alternative the alternative is wrong you are believing in something that isn't true well here it says uh fundamentalists critique the methods assumptions and institutions of the expert elites Mm -hmm. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah, critically thinking. I mean, critical thinking. <laughs> I mean, if you're a, a, a scientist doing real, scientists, real science in the real world, these scientists want their uh, experiments, observations. Mm-hmm. They want those things to be confirmed. They want other people to come repeat. Their, the, right. you, know, you should want to be questioned. You should welcome the, the, the prospect or the possibility of somebody holding you accountable for your conclusions. Right. But these elites don't want their conclusions questioned because right. they are unquestioned authorities, at least in their own viewpoint. Well, yeah. And then they go on to say, well, Christians have set up their own colleges and universities, publishers, bookstores, museums. museums. And then they link to the Creation right. Museum on that. And um, so, you know, we're just looking for ways to, you know, you hear a lot the, the term confirmation bias, right? That we're doing all of this just so we can hang out with our with our own tribe and basically all of us, you know, confirm what each other believes. Mm-hmm. And um, but they're not seeing that they're doing, they're the, doing the exact the same, thing. same thing. You know, the other all these other universities and museums are pushing their ideas about the past mm-hmm. man's ideas instead of instead of what God's word says. Exactly. Yeah. So it is it is very interesting to um, and and the thing is too like I, I think. It really depends on what you're talking about when it comes to science and things like that. Like, I mean, observable science that we do in the present, I don't know too many Christians that are questioning that. Um, That's not the types of things that we question. Um, You know, when we were in school or we were doing research or whatever, those things are just what everybody else does. It's not a problem. But it's when it comes to things that have happened in the past that that becomes really the issue where Christians are questioning things and and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, the experts are wrong on this because this is what God's word says. Right. So so it really yeah. it really shows that this is a worldview issue. All right, the next article. This comes from oh no, I don't know. Um, oh, I think it's this, I think it's the New Scientist. Um, it says resurrecting nature ex- extinct is not forever. All right. So what what movie does this make you think of? It sounds like Jurassic Park to me. <laughs> Now, some of our viewers, actually, we're getting to be kind of old, right? Yeah, yeah. we are. So some of our viewers maybe have seen Jurassic World, okay, mm-hmm. but not Jurassic Park. Park. And so what happened in Jurassic Park? So what did they decide, what did they try to do? Well, what they tried to do is, is essentially, you know, clone a dinosaur mm-hmm. based on some cells they found in a mosquito that was encased in amber. Amber, or okay, remember. yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, they take the DNA and all of a sudden they build these, this, this dinosaur. Right, they just we, fill in the blanks. They fill in the what's blanks. What's not there. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that was more that they didn't say than they did, but it right. was kind of a cool idea. But back at that time, you know, genome technology was not as advanced right. as it was today. So doing something like that was just totally incredulous. But now, today, we do actually have a lot of interesting techniques 
like uh, CRISPR, which we talked about before, which is a gene editing tool mm -hmm. where you can edit specific parts out and put new parts in. Mm -hmm. um, we've got reproductive cloning like Dolly, like Dolly. Um, where you take the, uh, the nucleus of the egg out and then put the nucleus of a somatic cell, which yeah. is like a regular a body, body cell. cell. You put that in. Um, and so we can do those kinds of things. So what they're trying to do is maybe think about bringing back extinct animals that we do have DNA uh, for. Um, because a lot of them have been taken out, they said, by human error. Um, and so let's put them back. Let's put them back. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things they want to put back is like the moa, which is an extinct bird from New Zealand, right? I think, yes. Um, it's been gone for about 600 years. And so they said, well, maybe we should bring that back. And there's always a question of, you know, as we have natural selection, artificial selection, things like mm -hmm. that happening, and diversity decreases, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And you know, how important, how important is this is organism it? to the ecosystem in which it is in? Um, my personal favorite, so we each have favorites, have favorite. okay, of what we want brought back. So in this article, my personal favorite is the gastric brooding frog, okay, which is the only known animal to turn its stomach into a womb from where it spews out its froglets by vomiting. Personally, something I want to see. Um, so as a biologist, yeah, that's a cool one. Okay, yeah, what's, no. your, what's your my favorite? My favorite is the stick nest rat. Suppose it lived in Australia out on the plains where it's very flat and what the stick nest rat did would build its home out of sticks and it would be <laughs> You know, three feet high, or it says uh, no, up to three meters long and a meter tall. Okay, so it's about three feet high. And it basically provided a biohabitat for everything from insects to reptiles. So basically, it's like a ecosystem high rise. High rise. And I think we certainly need the stick nest <laughs> rat back just as soon as possible. Oh, so so this is what they want to do. They wanna and, do. and they're trying to do that. The thing is, is that. Um, they're not there yet. I mean, because right. the problem is the DNA they do have is older, and it's still going to have gaps in it. Right. Think Jurassic Park, okay? Jurassic um, Park. So they're going to have to fill the gaps in, and so are they filling them in correctly? It's just like the whole mm -hmm. mammoth elephant thing, which they are actually actively working on. But it's going to be an elephant with some mammoth traits is basically right. what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, even, if, even in reproductive cloning, you don't just have the DNA and the nucleus of the cell. You have what's called mitochondrial DNA. Right. And that comes from a living organism. They don't, as far as I know, they don't transfer mitochondria because you'd have to transfer a lot. A lot. You know, it'd be hard to take mm -hmm. them out. So they don't do that. They just do the nucleus. So you're still going to have an animal that's only partially, ex you know, partially mm -hmm. was extinct yeah. or whatever you want to say. Um, and they even want to try to fix them, you know, before, before they, bring they bring them back, back right? Back. So it's still not going to be the original organism. They want to make them, um, like, immune to certain diseases and things like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Let's we'll see what happens. Well, it was surprising to me as I read the article. There are a couple of people who basically are starting to raise some red flags. Maybe this is not the smartest thing. What, do that, you really that, want T-Rex roaming around your backyard? I want the stick nest <laughs> rat to be back as soon as possible. <laughs> so but, that's... Uh, Again, to me, this is one of those uh, issues of just because you can do something should doesn't you? mean you really should well, do it. Well, we've got new ecosystems today, right. and so, uh, yeah, do you do that? So if you want to find out more about Jurassic Park and <laughs> about dinosaurs in general, um, you can, uh, Dr. Mitchell here has a video, Jurassic Prank, which is one of my favorite presentations <laughs> of his that he does. So some cool video clips, and he's... You have darker hair in this video, uh, too. Actually have, so. I actually have hair, which is surprising. Yeah, so, it, part of my hair has gone extinct. Yeah, so check that out. All right. Uh, this is from indiatimes.com. Mm -hmm. Giant penguins shared the earth with dinosaurs millions of years ago. Cool. Penguins. I'm, I'm convinced. I like, penguins. I, like okay. I like penguins. Okay. So um, the thing I thought when I read that title was, I, I thought dinosaurs evolved into birds. So how come they're around at the same time? Mm. Yeah. D don't confuse me with the facts. Okay, so these are penguins that they found in New Zealand, penguin fossils. And they how, were... How, how big were they? Five they feet were five tall. feet tall. <laughs> yeah. So if you like penguins, I mean, it's pretty yeah. cool to think about a five-foot-tall penguin. This um, would seriously be your all-time favorite penguin. <laughs> so they're enormous. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not all that surprising because right. we do find giant animals, um, mm -hmm like giant sloths, ground sloths, were really big. Right. We have some of those at the um, Ark Encounter where we kind of show some of these mm -hmm. bigger animals, giant turtles, I think the glyptodon or whatever. Some of these things, when I see them, like the Ice Age animals right. and stuff yeah. in museums, it's just like, 
Whoa, yeah. like we don't have anything like that today. So I think a five foot tall penguin would be pretty cool to have. So. It's not as cool as the stick nest rat, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, from culturefaith.com, mm -hmm. groundbreaking um, ACFI, which stands for the American Culture and Faith Institute survey, reveals how many adults have a biblical worldview. Or should we say many adults don't, don't. have a biblical worldview? So what, what stood out to you? I mean, what did about this article? Well, what stood out to me about this, first of all, is this is really not news to us right. here at Answers in Genesis yeah. because we've dealt with these sort of issues for years as we go out and we interact with churches all over the world and interact with people in the pews day in and day out. And as a speaker, that's one of the things mm -hmm. I do. Uh, I, I, this is not surprising. I mean, we've for years talked about the data that was generated from the already gone uh, survey. Mm -hmm. You know, Britt Beamer and America's Research Group did a survey uh, of a uh, thousand young people ages 20 to 29 about their, you know, why they left the church and, and when they decided to. And then we did the survey of the co uh, Christian colleges and seminaries and then the mm -hmm. ready to return data where we surveyed people, you right. know, the new generation in the church. So a lot of this is really not news to us. I think there's some uniqueness to the way this study was done because in so many ways this is almost kind of an operational study. Right. Well, they said, you know, 100 million adults claim right. to have a biblical worldview. And, you know, as soon as I read that, I'm like, mm -mm, no way. That's way too high. Well, um, in this study, they talked about the, the way they did it. They asked like 20 spiritual questions or questions about 20 spiritual issues. And then they asked 20 questions about how these people actually behaved or interacted. Right. So did so, what their mind, what right. they believe in their what mind. What you say and what you do. Right. What and you, and they what had sort do. of an index that they ranked people on. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of frightening. <laughs> well, and it, what it showed was that they said, um, so in the survey of the general public, 10% of American adults currently have a biblical worldview. That pales in comparison to the 46% of adults who claim, who claim to. to have a biblical worldview. So that's a difference of, instead of having like a roughly 112 million people who have a biblical worldview, you have 24 million right. people. Um, exactly. So that's a huge, huge gap. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it speaks to why what we do here at Answers in Genesis is so important. Because we're really trying to help people know that, you know, when you think about a biblical worldview, one of the, the big tenets of that, the foundation of that is that God's word is true Absolutely. from the very first verse. And having that authority of God's word and that truthfulness of God's word, that that's what we use to make the decisions in life and, and, um, and to, yeah, so, mm -hmm. and how we think. Um, when I was looking at, you know, the percentages they gave for, I mean, again, not surprising, right? So millennials, which is the 18 to 29-year-olds, yeah. just 4%, 4 basically had a biblical mm -hmm. worldview. 7% um, for the age bracket I'm in, not your age bracket. No, you keep um, going. You get there. <laughs> the 30 to 49-year-olds. 15% <laughs> for the 50 to 64-year-olds. There you go. Yeah, there you go. There we and go. then 17%. So it kept... You know, raising, rising, whatever, as you get older, which is expected. But um, nonetheless, I mean, even seeing those numbers, it, it's just, it is kind of, it's not yeah. surprising. It's just It's sad. disheartening. It's, in it's disheartening. It and um, I think it shows that why it is very important that children from a young age right. be taught a biblical worldview and that that is important. And we don't just wait till they get to like high school or, or something like that because it's too late. By it's that never point. too early to start building that foundation. Really? It, I know. And we have a lot of great curriculum and things like that here at Answers in Genesis. I encourage you to check out um, because we do want parents to understand the importance of that and starting at a, at a young age. All right. New scientists. Extinct Neanderthals still control expression of human genes. All right, so what they did was, because we have sequenced the Neanderthal genome now, mm -hmm. they've looked at the variations, certain variants um, that people still have in them today. We still carry Neanderthals, so to speak, genes or regulatory region in our DNA. And so um, they were comparing that to the human, the human, well, modern human variants is what we should say. Now, the thing is, is this isn't all that surprising because Neanderthals are still, they're, yeah. they're, they're human. They're human. I, I mean, so. they're 100% human, right. so they just had some characteristics, so to speak, that we still don't, we don't find as common today in the human population, but they nonetheless were 100% human. Um, 
So what they did was they basically looked at in different tissues to see if some, some individuals have like one Neanderthal gene and one human gene. Mm -hmm. And when we say that, again, the difference still isn't all that much, but it's still a variation. It's still different. And they said, well, for example, Neanderthal's genes are causing us to be taller and to keep us uh, reducing um, schizophrenia, right. okay, so for example. But then they said in other areas, other tissues of the body, they were less. They were less. In the brain and in the testes, supposedly, yeah. which you kind of found ironic. Yeah, because they were talking about the more advanced organs in the body, it's not quite as prominent, but then it talks about it protects us against gets some people to get schizophrenia. Which is brain. Which is brain. Yeah. Uh, so, and it doesn't always mean just because something has a lower activity doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or that right. it's doing something wrong or that's giving us, you know, that's lowering its effect. I mean, mm -hmm. genes go on and off, and so I don't necessarily know that that's bad. But it is interesting to see that these mm -hmm. variants um, may may are still active, are still but active. again, not surprising, it's not surprising because we're 100% human, we're, just we're like human. they are. So, exactly. all right, next one from CNN. Okay, Unlocking the Cage, which yeah. is the title of an HBO documentary, documentary yeah. swings into animal personhood debate. Absolutely. All right, so apparently they document a, an attorney by the name of Stephen Wise, mm -hmm. who apparently isn't very wise. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> I find that kind of funny myself. <laughs> kind of ironic. So what he is dedicated to doing is freeing chimpanzees, dolphins, and other intelligent creatures that are held in zoos and showcased as entertainment. Mm -hmm. So he says that they are autonomous creatures that should be able to live autonomous lives, right. and basically we're enslaving them. We're enslaving them. Yeah. He, now this is what got me, though. Uh -huh. So he said he's a wacky lawyer who says things like, and I quote, a person is not synonymous with a human being. Where, What's where, that? Where we heard that before. Yeah. Pro-choice. Pro-choice. Right? Exactly. Where they would say a person is not synonymous with a fetus right. or with an unborn with child an unborn in the womb. And I thought, it's just amazing when I see things like this, that people are willing to fight for the rights of the personhood of an animal, but they will not fight for the rights of of a person in the womb. Well, he's making the case that a person is not synonymous with a human being, but then he goes out and fights for their rights. Who's fighting for the rights of the unborn? I mean, yeah. you use the same terminology. Exactly. So you're right, it's very inconsistent. It's very inconsistent. And, um, yeah, that, they, that, they were, that they're willing to give personhood designations to animals, right. but not willing but, to give it to someone to who has unborn. the human, human chromosomes, right? right? Human genetic complement. Um, and if you want to find out more about, um, th this is a great DVD by Stuart yeah. Burgess called The Uniqueness of Man. Um, and he is an engineer over in England. And so this is really great at looking at um, the different design features in man. Mm -hmm. He will also be at our upcoming conference, The Best of British Bible and Science, May 5th through the 6th right. at the Creation Museum. So he'll be giving some talks on that, and you'll want to check that out. Okay, this next one. Yeah. This you, is, you said this was one of your favorites. This was my favorite one of the, of the okay. session today. So you can start us off. You. Well, basically what they found is that as the fetus matures in the womb, it actually starts learning language. It, it has some basis for language learning. And what they found is that... Uh, uh, young people, like uh, children who are adopted into other families, say a, a, a Korean child that's adopted by a uh, family uh, in, yeah. in Holland, for example, mm -hmm. has a greater ability to learn the Korean, the Korean right, make the th 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 than an equivalent child who was born Dutch. Dutch. And, 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 yeah. w and what they're finding is that these language learning processes actually start in the womb. Which is, like, way cool. Because, you know, right. they always hear this, oh, you should talk to your baby. And you wonder, Absolutely. you know, well, how valid is that? Well, it's Turns very out it's valid. valid. <laughs> Turns yeah. out it's very valid because they are learning how to form these words. Because, you know, when you try to mm -hmm. speak another language, especially one that's very different from Absolutely. English, like Chinese or Korean, mm -hmm. wow, you, you really struggle because some of those letters that are together, you have no idea have how no idea. to pronounce them. And even if you can or you learn how to, it's still hard to make that sound. But, like, for example, my daughter. Daughter, who's a, who we adopted from China, mm. it's saying that she would be able to speak Chinese and learn Chinese easier, be able to make those sounds right. than I would because she learned that in the womb. 
<laughs> but one of the things I noticed throughout this whole article was that they never referred to the baby in the womb as a fetus. Right. It was a baby. It was a baby. It's a human being that's learning things. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, you just think of the irony of that. So, so that non-human mass of cells yeah. in the uterus can actually learn language. Mm -hmm. the, the, the rudimentary, the foundations for learning language is possessed by that baby in the womb. Right. I mean, and that's and that's what's interesting. So when it's convenient to talk about the baby in the womb as a baby because right. it's learning, and so it would have to be a full a human being with all of these abilities to do this. They use that terminology, exactly. and when it's not convenient, they, they don't. don't use it. Another great DVD is by Dr. David Minton, yeah. fearfully and wonderfully made. This is one of the it's one, it's one of my all time. It's one of my all time favorites too, where he talks about the development of the baby in the womb, and you see how we are truly. Uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. All right, well, we are going to be um, signing off here. Um, I hope you've had an uh, um, enjoyable time with Dr. Mitchell and I. And um, we'll be back on Monday at 2.30 um, with Ken Ham. And um, thanks for watching. Thanks.